Hello everybody and welcome to the sixth and final Sea Nature session of this summer series. Just a few housekeeping rules. People please keep themselves muted um, just while each section takes place. Um, and can everybody hear me okay? Can somebody just confirm that so I make sure I'm not speaking? Excellent, thank you, Jamie, for that. Perfect. Okay, so Without further ado, we're going to follow the usual format that we have here. And we have a guest speaker today, uh, Sean Irving, who's joining us. Um, he's a zoology graduate um, from uh, Cambridge. Uh, but I'll let Jamie tell a bit more about him when that talk comes around. And as always, we have our usual fantastic contributions from various people here at the University of Salford and also outside of the university, too. Um, so hopefully this will be a really good uh, finale. But as always, we like to start off with finding out where everybody's uh, listening from today. Um, so some of you may be listening to this as a recording after it's happened, but for those here today, if you could please mark on the map where you are listening from. So if you're new to this, there's a little pencil button at the top of your screen there. And if you can click on it and then feel free to draw physically on the map where you are from. So try to avoid the color green, I guess. Um, oh, smiley face. Cool. Yeah, because I know we've got people from Scotland. Do we have anybody outside of the UK with us today? Uh, if so, please feel free to draw. Ocean. Almo's not with us at the today. <laughs> Fantastic. So still a really good spread because what we don't want is to talk about UK wildlife specific to Manchester, as glorious as Manchester is. So a nice even spread. Um, across the country there. So thank you very much, everybody, for that. Okay, so here is uh, this week's What Is It? Okay, um, the only clue being the same clue that it is every week, that it is British wildlife, um, not exclusive to Britain, it's not endemic. Um, so that's it. So by the end of the talk, um, I will ask you at the end, for you to write in the chat area what you think this could be. I've been making them a bit too easy, so hopefully this might have um, have you a little bit stumped. So this is the part where we all just openly chat now. So this is when you can unmute yourself or if you'd rather raise your hand and then I can come to you directly or feel free to chat in the chat box. What have you been observing? during lockdown. Obviously lockdown, I guess, kind of ends in England this weekend. So it's a nice way to end the series. What wildlife have we been seeing? Does anybody want to contribute? So we've got Professor Rob Young, a fox in the evening. Do you want to tell us a bit about it, Rob? Yeah, OK. Um, well, I walk my dog at dusk every night when I usually see um owls and other things but yeah just had to look across the road and there was a fox staring at me and my dog walking along which was quite unusual to see around where i live because there's been a lot of um development of new roads and things so i hadn't seen a fox in ages so it was nice to know there was some still around yeah for definite i've not had i've not had one yet so <laughs> Anybody else? I mean, if anyone's curious about the birds I've put on the slide, this was my wildlife sighting last week. Um, for anybody that doesn't recognise um, very hard to see these days in Britain because they have such a specific habitat requirements. And this is in Cheshire. Um, so I felt very, very lucky because it's been 10 years since I've seen one in the UK. Um, so yeah, I've, I've included my, my Twitter hashtag there in case anybody really does love birds and moths and wants to follow that. But does anybody else have anything to share? Um, I got, saw a zebra spider with a, with a fly in its fangs and you'll see that later. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. Good fun. So Hannah, you, Hannah, you've got your hand raised. Um, yeah, so on one of my walks, um, I went to uh, Oakwood Park and so I was walking through some woodland and um, 
yeah, I managed to make eye contact with a buzzard of all oh, things. Wow. Yeah, um, I was walking through and it looked a bit startled and it was flying towards me and out the corner of my eye I thought it was just like a daft wood pigeon but <laughs> no it was, it was it was a buzzard and it was just looking right at me so <laughs> I've never experienced anything like that so that was quite um, fascinating. Yeah cool thanks for sharing I think buzzards are having a really good year to be honest um, I seem to be seeing them everywhere so we've got a few more comments in the chat area too so David's seen white face data dragonfly yeah very cool it's a perfect time for dragonflies and damselflies right now and fiona has said she's seen ringlets and wild ponies well now i'm just jealous um, i worked with wild ponies in snowdonia and obviously i'm not allowed in wales at the moment so very jealous of that and then greg's said that he has seen an emperor dragonfly on his walks and roe deer fawn as well wow fantastic and sean I said he's seen a whole host of warblers, so chiff chaff, garden warblers, black caps, white throat, groppers, reed and sedge. Cool, it's, it's impressive you can ID them all. I mean, when it comes to warblers, I, I have to go off calls and songs because, they, I mean, it could be an unfor unforgivable comment to ornithologists, but I can't really tell them apart too well um, unless they're in the hand, but that's really great. Yeah, most of them are ID by call. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely much easier than looking at them yeah for sure do you have a favorite warbler sean uh grasshopper warblers are going to be one of my favorite um and they're really they sound really cool and they look really cool yeah that reeling noise is amazing isn't it yeah, I mean, yeah. Really so iconic. yeah yeah cool well thanks for that, everyone that's a real mix of stuff I, I like it when it's got invertebrates ranging all the way up to uh mammals uh that's really great and feel free to keep commenting throughout the talk by the way if anything comes to you So every week we like to do something we call webcam of the week. Um, this week's has been provided by Philip, so I'll let Philip introduce uh, this cam. I always like at this point to uh, take a little time of, of reflection and uh, a little time just to, to calm ourselves down and to uh, be aware of what's around about us. And these webcams provide a window of somewhere else other than just outside our own personal window outside our room and uh, this one is from the Shetland Isles. I've never been to Shetland it's high on the to-do list. It's always raining. Is it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> best, place in, best place in the world for European otters though. Isn't it meant to be good for orcas? Oh, wow yeah it's really good for orcas um i was there last no two years ago and we were hitchhiking round, and um uh, we were on the orca chat orca watch chat and about an hour behind us on our last bus of the day down through to lowick to so the capital um the orcas were on every the next, last ferry of the day but not the last bus of the day so we missed them all by an hour three times <sighs> nightmare the problem with these places and wildlife trips um yeah it's, it's very much a lottery sometimes uh, i find that because I'm, I'm one of those crazy chasing after bird kind of people and i often can be where the bird is but doesn't mean i've seen it there is a bird going left to right a uh, right to left and there's another one Can't make them out as to what they are, other than some form of gull by the wing shape. Judging by the size, could be herring gull or greater black pack gull. Mm. Don't know if anybody's got any other ideas. Ah, there we go, look. Or is that the greater or the lesser black pack gull? I'd guess the lesser black pack gull. Yeah. Goals were never my strong point, admittedly. Well, 
So as Philip said, we, we provide these links to these webcams and that's six we provided now um, for you to just go away and, and, and look at whenever you need that moment of escape and you want to pretend you're somewhere else, um, please do use these links. Um, you'll see different things every time. Uh, okay, so I, I might move on from here. Okay, so we're gonna Okay, so we're going to hand over now to Greg. Um, he started off giving us these absolutely fantastic tales of all the moths he's been seeing, and then it sort of extended out to orchids and all sorts of other wildlife. Um, so I think we're all sort of personally invested in Greg's adventures now. So for the final week, um, Greg, what have you got to tell us about this week? Uh, yeah, so uh, can you everyone hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, so this week was kind of a bit of a, a strange one. It started off, um, obviously, with the heat. Really good nights for moths. So um, I think just as the heat wave as we need to start, I had this moth, which is a new one for my name. Um, the night before, I had a very fresh silver wire, which was in a, a similar family. And um, this, this is slightly different as it's got this sort of silver line and the Y is sort of, sort of a bit disjointed. Um, along with these sort of three um, sort, of crest, sort of crests along the back. Um, but also, this garden, um, which is much more rural and had a lot of different species. This is, uh, oh gosh, I oh, forget this one. Um, brown line bright eye um which is very confusing because there's another species called bright line brown eye. um i was this is a one that i don't really get in my gardens but it's nice to uh, see them in someone else's garden quite lo local um there were some good numbers and this was on i think uh friday night which was pretty warm um I had lots of species lots of small elephant hawk uh, sorry regular elephant hawk moths uh common wainscots heart and darts had about four buff tips um which is quite a good number um and lots of these as well which is scalloped oak um these didn't really come in the trap this is probably one of the few that actually got in the trap but there's about five or six in the grass all outside the moth trap that night um so that's quite a quite a nice moth to get i did have one a couple of days before but unfortunately it flew out before i could get a picture so it's nice to finally get one um and then this, I think, I'm not too sure yet. I think it's an ear moth, which is known for its uh, quite distinctive white spot here. Uh, I'd have to check that one again there. I'm not completely sure. I think maybe the marking is a little bit off for an ear moth. Um, but I'll have to keep checking. Um, and then the kind of the weather got really bad for moth trapping over the weekend for me. Um, so last night was the first time in a while uh i'd set the trap um and i got this which is a dunbar which is quite a sort of nicely marked moth um a rosy tabby which is a sort of micro and it was quite a pretty one I, I i don't usually focus on the micros but this one caught my eye um and i did get a green pug as well somewhere um if i look uh where did i put it oh here we go uh yes green pug um it's sort of hidden in the uh, egg gardens um like not one of the one of the few moths i can actually identify because uh pugs are a notoriously difficult species um i think it's a, a pug it does look like a pug um i'm a bit i'm a bit sort of stuck on that one um across the country of course the uh, warm weather particularly on thursday night when it was about 15 degrees was uh, really good so at sandwich bay which is somewhere i've featured a lot recently i was due to be, be on a placement later on in july unfortunately that's not going to happen anymore but it's still really interesting to keep track of the moths we see or they get over there and this was a nice one this is light crimson underwing which is one of the red underwing family um and i think a first record for the observatory so um as it was really warm that night i think they had uh let's look at the figure here 594 moths of 104 species and a lot of these are really impressive so Ruby tigers, a really nice one. Um, light crimson underwing, of course. Festoon, uh, silky wainscot. 
uh, Swallowtail Moth, which I've featured before. Um, but this is another one that he caught, which is called a Leopard Moth, which is hopefully one I'm going to get in my garden. Um, it's got these wonderful sort of blue spots. Um, the adult doesn't feed. Uh, it simply comes out of its cocoon and flies around trying to find a mate. And that's about it. Um, as you can see, lots of diversity there. Um, however, with the heat wave, I also had some other sightings. Um, so I went to a local site for butterflies uh, to find this, which is a large blue, a very rare species uh, introduced into the U reintroduced into the UK, uh, dependent on a type of ant uh, to rear its young. Um, I think they can also be found somewhere down in Somerset, uh, but this is at Day Daneway Banks in Gloucestershire, which if any of you watch Spring Watch, you yeah. might have known it, it featured in the final week. Um, and it's a really good site, cracking site. It's all about, sort of about six large blues. I think this is a female because uh, it's a little bit bigger. Um, also, this lovely grasshopper I just managed to catch out there. And this was on, uh, I think, a day where it was about 30 degrees. And I got out there about eight o'clock and it was already about 25 or 26. Um, so the heat was already really building. Butterflies were everywhere. Marble whites, meadow browns, ringlets, uh, lots of small skippers. Um, Pyramidal orchids are doing really well now. This is a striking one I saw, um, really out. Um, and then I had a visit to some oak woodland nearby uh, for some woodland butterfly species. This is a purple hair streak. Um, they don't usually come down from the ground. They usually fly around the canopy um, and then they land sort of on the, the muddy rides alongside and sort of taking the minerals. I think that's what this one was doing. Um, it wasn't a very good photo, but I might have to get it. Um, uh, if it was it had its wings open, you'd see there'd be quite a purple on it on the underside. So it's not like the green hair streak where all the colours on the uh, sort of back of the wing. It's it's um, it's sort of hidden. Um, and there's lots of common spotted orchids out there. Really impressive common spotted orchids in their towers. Um, there's yeah, really good number, and they were still out um, everywhere else. They seem to be going in now, unfortunately. But um, yeah, these ones were really still holding out, I guess, because of the shade from the trees. Um, this is another species, White Admiral, uh, butterfly well associated with woodland rice. So this entire forest had a long path with a bramble on the side and they come down to feed. And there was, they're very fast, but I managed to get this one sort of feeding or too busy occupied on a bramble. So I managed to get the picture. And then, of course, uh, the star of an oak woodland or any butterfly is... Uh, the magnificent purple emperor which is a woodland butterfly um found at the very top of oak trees and it's got this wonderful iridescent color um, this one leading on I think fermented oak sap uh, and it came down to the ground they don't of often do that only really in warm days um so i was really pleased this is the first time i've ever seen one um and i think there's been a book published by them recently uh by someone called matthew oates who i think was the national trust butterfly uh, chairman um, and it's so I think it's called something like his imperial majesty which is the nickname this butterfly's got because it's very big it's our second largest butterfly after the swallowtail um, and it's it's amazing um, unfortunately it was too quick for my camera because it's getting quite dark but you can see on both wings sort of the iridescent purple um, and I think I've got a video of it somewhere um, again another white admiral uh, yes yeah, so here we go here's the video you see, it, it didn't really want to open its wings very wide, but when it did, I was just hit by this amazing purple colour. Um, so that's wonderful. But, for, but I'd be lying if I said that was the best sighting this week. Uh, just after Wednesday's session, I received a call from a local birder uh, that about a couple of minutes away, a male redback shrike had been found in Gloucestershire. So I instantly rushed over there and it was standing on sort of the wire, perched uh, for a good time. Lots of people were there. It was quite tame. Shrikes are kind of a really good bird if uh, for uh, twitches because they they sort of they like to be in open perches where they can catch their wildlife. So they're not hidden or skulking in any bush. This one was really displaying itself quite well. I think I might have accidentally posted it on the Sea Nature thing, but I think either I removed it or someone else did, which is good. Uh, I didn't mean to do that. Um, but uh, yeah, really good sighting. Um, first one for me this bird went extinct as a breeding species i think in the 80s 
if I remember from the New Forest. Um, so unfortunately, it doesn't exist much in the UK anymore, apart from a couple of migrants every season. Um, so that was a really exciting sighting for me, especially as a male. And I think that's that's probably it for me, uh, wildlife wise. Um, no, that was, that was great, Greg. That was and just gripped me off with the shrike at the end. So thanks for that, buddy. Um, <laughs> It's one of my favourite. I, I just love shrikes. Uh, their behaviours, their aesthetics, everything, as you say, very, very cool bird. Um, so, yeah, if anyone's got any comments for Greg, either ask them now or feel free to chat away in the chat box. Friend, although that may just be because, unlike almost everyone else in his year, I never tutored him. Um, he did an undergraduate degree in zoology at the University of Cambridge and he's taking a year out working on his wildlife photography and videography and working in a climbing centre. Um, and he's starting a master's in ecological economics, hopefully in September this year, although that may be COVID dependent. Um, I tried several times myself to photograph the central Cambridge foxes. Um, I had no excuse. I lived five minutes from them and I never, ever saw them. I got absolutely nowhere. Um, Sean, on the, on the other hand, did rather well. And this feeds on nicely from a reference which Professor Young provided earlier in a C Nature episode a few weeks ago, because this, this talk is partly about the evolution of the urban fox. So I will stop talking and leave Sean in charge. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Um, I just I'm going to do about five minutes. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, urban foxes and their kind of ecology um, and how why we have so many urban foxes in the UK. And then I'm going to show you a few pictures um, which are kind of linked to the ecology because it's much easier to photograph an urban fox, which is accustomed to humans, than to photograph uh, a rural fox because they tend to run away because they're used to being hunted by humans rather than provided food. So. Uh, so just a little bit about the red fox. Um, so the red fox is the most abundant carnivore in the world. Um, I couldn't find the estimates of how many there are, but it's safe to say there are a good few million worldwide. Um, and they're getting more and more prevalent in cities all over the world. Um, and so there are about half of the ones in the UK um, live in towns and cities, and that's gone up hugely. So that's probably tripled since 1990. Um, so there are loads and loads of foxes around. You've quite possibly seen them around Manchester or, or other towns and cities you live in. Um, so we think they probably came to the UK during came into cities from rural environments in World War One, um, because during World War One we did quite a lot of ripping up of hedges, um, and we also um, at, the, at the end of World War One our lifestyles changed such that there were more people in cities and more waste food around. So there's much more butchers producing waste food. We ate less offal, so there was more of that around in bins. Um, more people eating stuff like fish and chips with dirty wrappers, which foxes really like. Um, and so they started coming to cities and then we started kind of Bristol and London. And now pretty much every UK city has a pretty large stable population of foxes. Um, oh, yeah, keys don't work. So there are quite a few kind of um, personal observations or kind of hearsay about adaptations of foxes to urban environment. There seems to be rather less science, hard science and work what they've changed, but um, quite a lot of people say that they've got a lot more, a lot smaller. And um, so in order to fit through small spaces like holes, holes in fences or um, under kind of gates and stuff, urban foxes apparently are a fair bit smaller. Um, and they um, also are a whole lot more bolder. Um, and I've spoken to a few people who've said that they have got to know kind of families of foxes and the second generation of urban foxes often seem to be a lot bolder than the first generation. So if a, gen if a city is or an area, uh, an urban area is recently inhabited with foxes and um, all the foxes that are coming from rural areas tend to kind of keep their rural habits. And so they're really quite scared of people and they they'll tend to come out at night or times when there aren't very many people around. And if they see people, they run away pretty quick. But then there tends to be a po uh, the next generation, so the cubs which grow up in the rural environment, um, which get a lot bolder. They kind of learn that being nice to people tends to um, get them food um, and therefore they tend to get more food, more cubs, and we end up with a much higher rural population density. So some of the est some estimates estimate that there's greater than 10 times um, density of foxes in UK cities versus in kind of 
areas of the UK countryside populated with foxes. Um, and most of that is down to the fact that there's more food. Um, there's actually generally thought to be a kind of a higher prevalence of disease, so more mange and more nasty diseases. Um, but they, that tends to affect foxes after they've had a, um, a round of cubs. And so it's still selected for and there's still a pretty high population density. And in general, urban foxes, there's been some tracking data which has shown that urban foxes don't tend to move around quite nearly so much because cities have a much more stable climate um, and a much more stable food source. We throw out food all year and we keep our city our homes warm and so the cities stay warm. Um, whereas um, rural foxes tend to move up and down hills or into microclimates so that they can stay warm in winter and find food in winter and then they can move and have a, a broader food source in summer. Um, so there is some pretty recent science on looking at urban foxes, which I thought I'd just share with you briefly before I got on some pictures, um, which was a paper that came out in May this year, which looked at uh, Edinburgh University's museum, have a whole load of fox skulls from the last 500 years. And it was a longitudinal study looking at how foxes' skulls have changed over time, which I thought was really interesting, and comparing um, urban foxes with rural foxes and looking at the potential for kind of speciation of an urban or a rural fox or subspeciation. Um, and there's pretty um, pronounced differences, which are pretty characteristic of either kind of what's gets termed domestication syndrome or um, a general urbanization or suburbanization of many species. Um, so their um, much reduced um, sexual dimorphism, 28% um, less in urban foxes compared to rural foxes. Um, I couldn't find any information on why we think that might be. It's potentially there's less, uh, uh, it, it comes with it being smaller in that there's a more advantage to being a smaller fox um, in urban environments and therefore the dimorphism is reduced. And then the second thing um, that the author found, which I thought was pretty cool, was that the the whole face shape has got has changed of a urban fox. So they, if you think about their their head, a uh, rural fox has got like quite a long, thin snout with quite a small end, and it broadens fairly quickly um, towards their their head, so like the base of their nose. Whereas a uh, a rural fox, an urban fox, sorry, has got a much a narrower kind of around the base of their nose and then a wider end of their nose and a shorter snout altogether, which we think is probably um, uh, an increased olfactory dependence in the cities, the less need to see fast moving prey and an increased force, so an increased um, able to bite hard, the decreased ability to snap quickly at something, so like a moving shrew or something um, compared to in the countryside. So one of the nice things about urban foxes is that they're really nice and easy to photograph um, because you kind of just sit there and they walk straight past you. And um, so unlike most of wildlife photography, you can generally do urban foxes with a pretty short lens. So this is maybe two meters from me, this image. And it kind of shows you just how how comfortable they are with urban environments, walking straight past an office. You can see the clock in the background um, quite early in the morning. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I thought that was quite nice. It shows where they are. Um, and if it's with a slightly longer lens, but they're just so, this just fox just looks so relaxed, and um, which is such a like a, a pleasure when you're a wildlife photography, where a wildlife photographer, because often if you're sat really close to something, it'll be keep looking up at you and being nervous. But with these foxes, because they're so accustomed to people, I was able to spend a few mornings there. I think I spent about two weeks where I went most mornings and they just got to know who I was and were so relaxed around, which meant that you get shots like the next one, which is when they're hunting. So they were just more than happy to hunt right next to me so this is a wild fox and a wild mouse and it was just i hadn't spotted the mouse it caught it right next to me it's pretty gruesome they spent quite a long time playing with it but this was kind of the death blow um and then you can get this was again with a fairly fairly short lens for wildlife photography this fox was more bothered about a mouse that ran past it than it was by me sitting there right next to it so the link in the video uh, in the link that Jamie sent is uh, just a 30 second video to finish this talk.
yeah, pretty safety questions. Yeah, thanks for that, Sean. That was really interesting. And I think a lot of compliments are coming through in the chat for those incredible, unique um, shots that you managed to get. Um, so does anyone have any questions for Sean at this point? No? OK, well, we've got all of your details there, Sean. I'm sure if anything comes to us, thank you so much. Uh, for sharing with us right. and thank you Jamie um, for putting uh, Sean forward for the task um, that was that was really good thank you so much thank you for having me oh I'll just come out of that one Okay, so now it's time for our video showcase. Um, and this week, uh, we have a wonderful video from Fiona Pitcher, who's here with us today. She's kindly let us use one of her videos. Um, would you like to say anything about it, Fiona? Um, can you hear me all right? Yeah, yeah we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, so um, this was, um, uh, forgive me, I'm, um, I think one of you has kindly ID'd the, the bee. Uh, species, but I would be good to get confirmation on that. So this was a, a nest that, that our daughter noticed, um, literally um, sort of about two feet in from the garden path in quite a small, typical country cottage garden. And they've been incredibly busy. Um, from a personal point of view, it was the first time I'd really tried to work hard with a slow-mo. And what I liked about it from I hope you'll enjoy it, is that you can actually, see, if you look carefully, you'll see the different coloured pollen going in and out um, very well, which I hadn't otherwise seen. I later looked this up, and what I'm intrigued to know is that it suggested in, in, in articles that I saw that these ground nests have a sort of a little bit like a mini version of a rabbit warren, so that they are they are shared. But any more insight on that, gratefully received, because I'm... You'll have to forgive me, I'm a, I'm a wildlife TV expert, not a wildlife expert. So uh, do, you, do we want to have a look at it now? Yes. Yeah. Does anybody have any comments following on from what Fiona said just now? What produces um, blue pollen, says Jamie? It was Ceanothus. We, we, and it was, it was, it's not in flower for very long. We have it for about three weeks. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so if anybody has any further comments or questions, uh, please 
drop Fiona a message in the chat area and thank you so much for sharing that video with us. Pleasure. Okay, so for once, instead of just hosting, I'm going to try and claim I, I, I know things. Um, and there's a lot of great photographers here, um, and lots of photographs, which is excellent. Um, but one thing we've not really spoke very much about is, is about listening um, to wildlife. And previously with my research, I've worked in, in cloud forests. Um, where around 80% of birds recorded in these sorts of habitats is just from sound alone, um, whether that's because the birds are elusive by nature or just, you know, very hard to see. Um, so your ears are super important as well um, in terms of appreciating uh, the wildlife around you. And so I want to talk a little bit about uh, nocturnal migration. Um, so what I find remarkable basically is what goes on when we go to bed. So we're all talking about the things we've seen while we've been up and about, but when you go to bed, nature very much, wildlife is very much still active. Um, so I wanted to do a hobby that didn't compromise my sleep. And what I do is I like to uh, record um, uh, the, the birds that are flying over my house, basically. Um, it's a great time for birds to move between sites because they can avoid predators. Um, and many wading birds uh, behavior is also dictated by the tides. Um, so when it's high tide, they'll be um, in roosting areas and at low tide um, feeding areas for foraging. And so they obviously have to move in between. And so the best time um, to do this is at night. So it's a really interesting time um, to be listening out for their vocalizations. So we call it hashtag knockmig if you're a Twitter user um, and want to get involved in this sort of thing. And I'll refer to knockmig probably a lot throughout this. So how do we do it? Um, so as I say, you'll be pleased to know it doesn't interrupt your sleep. You simply leave a recording device um, outside in your garden when it's not raining um, and set it to record from dusk continuously until dawn. And then you'll upload a single track to a software program of your choice. Now I recommend Audacity um, because it's free. That's always good. Um, particularly if I've got sh students listening, something as I did as an undergrad, it's free, it's readily available um, and you can user friendly as well. And then what you do is you convert your track from an audio file um, into what we call a spectrogram. And what do I mean by that? They look a little bit something like this. So the top picture there is a spectrogram when there's no sound at all. And below is an example of what you would see if a bird flew over. So in this instance, I've picked a quail. And these are all recordings that um, I've done here in Cheshire at my house. And the quail will fly over and it will call. And you'll note those repeated bars. So in this case, it's called uh, nine times in quick succession. And each species is calls and songs. Um, they'll have unique patterns. So here are spectrograms for a couple more. So you've got a ringed plover there and then below that a water rail and I've circled the sound bars just in case they're a bit difficult to see um, on the screen there and Jamie's very kindly um, put two links in the chat area there so if you'd actually like to view the spectrogram and hear those calls um, please do click on those links So initially, when you start off this sort of hobby, the shapes, the sounds will, of course, be unfamiliar. Um, they're more just useful for, for picking out noises. Um, but you'll start to learn to interpret the patterns. And so the height uh, will correspond to pitch and width to the length of the call. Um, so obviously, a basic knowledge of bird calls would be very useful. But um, even the masters who think they know all the calls can definitely be baffled by these um, recordings. Um, 
So even the more common species that, that you think you're familiar with um, you can easily throw you. And, you could, and you also, it's very easy to capture man-made noises or non-natural noises. So whether it's sort of police sirens, um, creaky gates, um, foxes, um, even insects. It depends on the sensitivity of the recorder um, that, you, uh, that you're using. So, for example, this is a recording. I just wanted to tease you all. What what do you think this might have been? I mean, it looks like a bird. Any guesses? Go on, be brave. Write it in the chat area or call out. What do you think this recording was? Oh, and Jamie's just included a link for the water rail if you're interested. That's in the chat area. Well, this, this looked like a bird and I got very excited. Um, but it turns out it was just a dog barking so it is a very tricky um, challenging hobby to take on um, is knock mig because not only does it test your knowledge of um, bird calls and songs but you have to have a certain element of patience in trying to decipher some of the more unfamiliar patterns and work out uh, what they are and a way of doing this is referring to of course online libraries of bird calls to confirm the species that you think you've heard so a good website that i use is zeno canto um, so you can see it's spelled at the top there xeno dash um, c-a-n-t um, and that's an online library of almost 10,000 species and then what you can do is compare the audio as well as the appearance of the spectrograms um, to back up your suspicions as it were and as i say I like hobbies that are challenging where I can learn new things and, and this is certainly one of those because you will learn the calls um, and start to recognise um, those patterns. Um, so as I mentioned there are some species that you have very low chances of actually seeing um, but they are around. Um, so recording their calls really is the best way to confirm that they're there. Um, and during lockdown uh, my husband and I, both ornithologists, we started our lockdown list you know, and we recorded just here in Winsford from the garden and locally on the dog walks, 111 species. But I will admit that 25 of those were just from Knockmig, just from recording them um, during the night. Um, if we hadn't have done that, we would have had no records of those 25 species. And as you can see, um, they included some, some very good ones. Um, I never thought um, in my urban area I would have a water rail uh, fly over the house. Um, so you really do find some interesting things. So as a final slide from me, um, yeah, so during the busy migration periods, um, the first couple, hour, uh, first couple of hours of the night um, can be very productive and we're now progressing from summer soon into autumn and that's a very uh, big uh, migration period for birds, a very exciting time to capture some weird and wonderful species that probably shouldn't be um, in this area and are simply flying over and you might be able to catch them. So some advice, we use an Olympus LS3, um, it doesn't have an external microphone and you can pick up something similar to this for around 50 uh, quid and then you can get more elaborate attachments so an external microphone, parabolic reflectors as well just to amplify the sound um, uh, and just reduce that background noise. Um, you could spend up to half a grand on um, elaborate attachments if you wanted to but as I say we just use this very basic setup and it's done as quite well so it just depends how far you want to take it so i've included my email there if anybody has found this of interest to them and that's all from me so i'm now going to hand over to jb for our final session of the series of lights camera and action thank you danny that was a great talk right the file should be here already here we are So, um, thank you for bearing with me over these six weeks. I've, I've certainly had a lot of fun kind of get, getting this all together. I'm going to do a bit of a wrap up today about what I've learnt, both photographically and in terms of really enjoying <coughs> the local insect life, excuse me, and really finding that messing around with insects is very good when, for all of us, 
until really the 4th of July, there really wasn't much other wildlife we could find. I mean, the RSPB hides are still shut, for example. And um, the cute, tiny, fluffy killer I alluded to earlier, but we're going to deal with that at the end of the talk. So firstly, um, I started with a fairly um, low opinion of what small compact cameras could do in terms of wildlife photography. I thought they weren't, they wouldn't focus close enough for macro and I thought they didn't have enough reach for telephoto. And I also didn't really think that central Chester was very good for, wild, for insects anyway. Um, now the latter view about long lens photography may to an extent be correct, but after all, and I'll show you a picture of it later, I was working with a very small camera that's designed for underwater use, and there are compact cameras that have far more telephoto reach than the one I used. So really I think the jury's out on that. You can, with a lot of compact cameras, get a lot of, of good distant work of wildlife. But in terms of close-up photography, I was completely wrong. This compact camera and many others have a very good macro setting. I'm going to explain to you in a few slides why it's arguably better than an expensive digital SLR with a dedicated macro lens. So if you look on this slide, the biggest rectangle is the view you would get with a, a full-frame SLR, so an expensive camera with a dedicated close-up lens. The second frame is what you would get with a crop sensor SLR with a dedicated macro lens. <clears throat> and the little rectangle will indicate you can fill the whole image with a subject about 12 millimeters by nine, in this case, smaller than the fly, <clears throat> with the compact camera. Sorry for the coughing. And moving on to the next slide, this shows that yes, you get a lot of background with the full frame camera, but you really don't get close enough. With a crop sensor camera, it's a little bit better, but with the little compact camera, and as I said, they're just over hundred pounds on eBay at the moment, you can get an incredibly detailed shot of this animal. So it really is a wonderful, wonderful close up camera. As for the size and weight of, and cost, I couldn't even get the full frame camera on the weighing scales. It's kind of falling off the side, but you can see with the lens, it weighs in at 2.2 kilos. The crop sensor one is 1.6 kilos, and my trusted little compact camera is just over 250 grams. So there's a massive, massive difference in terms of affordability and weight and compactness. Now, I would say that some photography is going to demand a camera that weighs more than a quarter of a kilo, but I'd argue that close up photography really doesn't. OK, so that's kind of a photographic recap. Um, and we are now I'm just now going to talk. really about one of my favorite animals, my favorite invertebrate, certainly. <clears throat> and I've been annoying them all summer, but early in the week, I finally got some photos of one with some prey. So this is a zebra spider, um, probably a female. Um, you can generally tell that why she's more like, by the fact she's more like eight millimeters long rather than five. And her, her chelicera, which are these mouth parts, are large rather than massive. The males have very large chelicera to do with mating. Um, so she is eating what is probably one of the species I studied in my PhD. It's probably the marmalade fly. It's a little bit hard to tell because it's not particularly at a very healthy angle because it's busy being eaten, um, but could well be a marmalade fly, otherwise known as Episurphus. And I looked a little bit more into these and I found out a little bit about their vision. And they have eight eyes and the, I'm just going to go forward for now, you have the anterior medial eyes, they're very big, very much on, on, on the front of the face. You have the anterior laterals and on the side you have the tiny um, posterior medials and the larger posterior laterals. Um, I'm not really going to talk about any of these apart from the anterior medials. And if we go back to the previous slide, you can see that these very large eyes with the green 
cone of view are have a very narrow field of view and although they're very good for magnifying and spotting prey they're not very far apart and they haven't got a very high resolution so they can't measure distance um, in the way that a spider needs for jumping onto its prey so they do use the anterior laterals for measuring distance to an extent but they can also do it with the anterior medials and i'm just going to explain how so what goes on is that the anterior medials focus um, onto four different types of receptor cell some with uv sensitivity and some with green sensitivity and they focus them at different depths and the, the, the UV sensitivity is near the surface and the green sensitivity is at depth. Because, and therefore, they can measure the distance by comparing, the, by measuring the amount of defocus, the amount, the amount of out of focus characteristic of that green layer on the surface. So that's how they measure distance. This is approximately the same as the way the autofocus works in a camera. So a really wonderful piece of evolution that accurately measures distance. And given that they can easily jump maybe 20 times their body length, that is incredibly important to be able to measure distance. They then they leave a silk trail, a silk string behind, so that if they make the jump wrong, they can just wind their way back and start again. So beautiful, beautiful animals. Um, it turns out that many of them will simply attack anything that fills an angle in the field of view above five and a half degrees. So wonderful, wonderful, crude, beautiful, beautiful animals. And they're pretty cute. I hope you might agree. So a few more pictures of this beautiful zebra spider. Um, again, with the upper surface, this is not rotated. This is the angle it was sitting at. Um, and eventually it scuttled off and hid in a flower bed. And a close up here, they're wonderful things. So finally, um, I didn't just learn photographic things in the last six weeks. I also learned that I found that in terms of my mental health, which I think a lot of us have struggled with during lockdown, I found the challenges, the photographic challenges incredibly helpful. I found incredibly healthy. I found that the microscopic world of invertebrates is available for anyone with access to any green space at all. And it's a truly fabulous world. I've loved macro photography for 15 years, but during lockdown, I felt a new lease of life in my passion for these wonderful, wonderful animals. They're essential for life on Earth, for ecology, for pollination, for reducing pest populations, etc., etc. And their intricacies and beauty really rival many, many vertebrates, I think. So thank you for bearing with me in all this insect photography. If you have any questions, drop me a message on Facebook. And I'd like to also finally thank Sean again for dropping in at very late notice. Um, all the best. And I'm going to hand back to Danny. Excellent. Thank you, Jamie. I will just stop sharing your presentation and move on back. OK. So our last contribution from Professor Rob Young, um, telling us some cool things that have been on the internet this week. Over to you, Rob. Thank you, Danny. Yeah, so starting off this week with an app, um, as many of you know, I spend a lot of my time abroad looking at wildlife. So one of the things that's been really helpful for me for finding wildlife in the UK is this Wildlife Trust Nature Finder. Um, it's a great app. I mean, it can help you find local wildlife. It actually, once you've downloaded it, you can select a map option and it'll bring up the map of the Great Britain and you can hone in into your local area and then it will show you all the wildlife trust reserves in that area. It also gives you all the information about the wildlife trust and it provides you with information about different species. And if we weren't in the pandemic, it would also provide you with information about events that the Wildlife Trust 
are actually organizing but obviously at the moment there are very few events being organized so this is a great little app to find kind of little local nature reserves that you probably hadn't realized that were on your doorstep so certainly from the 4th of july i'm going to be using this a lot more to go around cheshire at places i didn't know existed nearby to myself so the new story that struck me this week was what's been called the anthropocene pause so we know that people are talking that we're in the anthropocene age so an age where humans have greatly affected the planet well now we're in the anthropocene pause because of the pandemic and this has created a unique situation on the planet a global experiment to see what would happen when we remove most of human activity on the wildlife on the planet so the association of biologers so this is a group of biologists who use devices mainly to monitor the movements of wildlife have been putting together a series of projects around the world to look at how wildlife is being affected because we've all heard stories about animals coming into urban environments and so you know they wanted to know what really is happening so get some good quantified data this is probably going to be a one in a hundred year event I hope the pandemic so this will be very important that we get data about how animals have been affected and of course it's not been positive for all animals we know that in southeast asia primates which have been dependent on being fed by tourists have been having a very bad time because there are no tourists there feeding them so commensal animals have sometimes suffered quite a bit from um, the consequences of the the pandemia so it'll be interesting to see the results coming out of all this project on a personal note i really regret that when i ran out of my office with my computer and things like that when the um, pandemic started that i didn't bring all my passive acoustic monitoring devices with me home because i realized and trevor cox a uh, lecturer in acoustics said to me we should be recording the environment around our houses to see how the sounds have actually changed and i have all the equipment but unfortunately it's in my office so unfortunately it's an opportunity lost i wasn't able to go back and get that equipment and the final thing is a resource and this is about uk wildlife and it's mainly a great resource explaining the wildlife and countryside act this is the main act in the uk which protects our wildlife and with all government acts this one is particularly long it's particularly complicated the nice thing i like about this website is it takes you through the act and explains it to you in normal terms so you don't have to be a lawyer to understand you know what the act is about and so this gives very good guidance on what you can and cannot do in the uk in relation to our wildlife and it's something of course as well as like to go out and enjoy wildlife we should be very aware of that we're not doing anything which contravenes you know the regulations which are there to protect them and i think i'll stop there for today excellent thank you so much rob um, i think luke and i were just saying we're racing to download that app just now but the resource in particular is incredibly uh, useful so thank you very much So that brings us to the end of the presentation, but not before we identify the what is it. So if anybody wants to give it a go in the chat area or to call out loud, please do. What is the image? Marsh fritillary, snake's head fritillary. There are two suggestions that have been put forward. Can I get a third attempt? Spotted orchid. So at least we're gauging that it's a plant, not animal. So the answer is a snake's head fritillary. Well done, Philip James. And very close, Fiona. And Sean, you, you got that it was a flower. You, you know, it, yeah. They were excellent attempts from everybody. and. Well done, Philip, for getting it. Um, 
if anybody doesn't know about this flower, okay, so um, obviously well known for the pink and purple check pattern um, that resembles a snake, hence the name. Um, it's sort of declining in numbers um, due to the loss of our meadows in general, um, but it can be seen in spring. I mean, I saw some here in Cheshire, um, but they can be seen throughout England. So that's that. So that brings us to the end of this week's session and the end of our summer series. We will keep the Facebook page up and running and hopefully be posting on there um, with regular updates and particularly about when we will think about starting up a second series. A big thank you to everybody who contributed today. Um, so that including Greg, Fiona, um, Jamie and Rob. Big thank you as always. And then a special thank you to our guest speaker, um, Sean. It was a great talk. Um, details are all in the recording. Um, should you want to get in touch with any of the people that have spoken today. Um, big thanks to Philip as well for putting this all together. And I think we can uh, stop the recording from there.